Okay, guys, we are back for the final part three of this entire workshop. The part one was two and a half hours. Part two was a little bit uh, more than that, almost three hours. And now this is the final section for the workshop. Okay, so we're going to get into now understanding the Merkaba, Merkaba, however you want to pronounce it. We're going to first start by understanding the fundamental, fundamental nature of our reality. Like, what is the third dimension? Scientists have now discovered what the ancients already knew, that the third dimension is a hologram of what the ancients or sages would call sleep, uh, dream world or dreamy world or sleepy time. And that we were a mere shadow of a higher dimension. Okay, this is an ancient text, guys. And now we have modern science confirming what ancient sages, texts, and tablets have said for eons, for millennia. Important to understand these multidimensional crystals because when you get into Merkaba, talk and you're talking about portals and wormholes and stargates, <clears throat> you're talking about um, an using angles to enter into other dimensions. All dimensions are in angles of each other. Right now, <clears throat> we're in an 11 dimensional universe. We have 11 dimensions in this universe or it would collapse on itself. The structure of this universe is made of 11 dimensions. Now, each dimension, people think of dimensions as something being so far away. Each dimension is stacked right on top of each other, literally so close that they're touching. And the only, diff the only thing that keeps you from entering into another dimension is your frequency. If your frequency doesn't match that dimension, you cannot enter it, okay? You can't phase shift from the third dimension into the fourth dimension. However, from higher dimensions, it appears that it's easier to phase shift down into uh, uh, thicker densities, which is incredible. But from the third dimensional platform that we are, we can't move up as easy. It takes a great level of knowledge, understanding, and frequency and vibration to move up, or technology, which we're going to talk about shortly, as the ancients had the same technology that I'm going to show you. Um, now it's easy for us to move down, just like it's easy for them, for them to come from higher to lower dimensions, it's the same for us. We can easily get into the second dimension. You can, you can see that just as plain and simple by drawing something on a piece of paper or creating a two-dimensional structure inside of a computer and, uh, and observing it from every angle. And then even going down to one dimension, just drawing lines. We have the ease of going down dimensions, but the, the hard part is ascension. Moving up, that's where the hard part is. Uh, Merkaba meditation is designed to move you up dimensions. <clears throat> Merkaba, also spelled Merkaba, translates literally to light, spirit, body. The Merkaba symbol is a, uh, is a shape made of two intersecting tetrahedrons that spin in opposite directions. Counter-rotating star tetrahedron is what you're going to be getting inside of, creating a three-dimensional energy field. And this energy field is a vehicle of ascension utilized to take people from one place to another or one dimension to another as well. And this is what the ancients used it for, the Merkaba light energy vehicle. It's talked about ancient times tremendously. Remember, what, where does the power source come from? Remember we talked about this earlier? 3.75, uh, 37.5 trillion cells in your body, each cell generating 0 0.07 volts of electricity creating a total of 2.63 trillion volts of electricity in the human body. Remember that? That's your power source for your Merkaba. <clears throat> this is the cover of uh, the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, uh, which is a famous ancient writing. And you can see what he has in his hand. He's got a star tetrahedron. He's got a Merkaba in his hand. Very plain to see, very easy to see. He's got the Merkaba and uh, Ankh on his arm. We're going to touch on these two um, objects right now. We're going to go in deep. Who is Thoth? He's also known as Hermes Trismegistus. He was a real person. Some people think he was this fictional make-believe character. No. The guy was in the physical form. He had the capability of transferring his consciousness into other avatar bodies, as he said himself. The halls of Amenti were discovered underneath the Great Pyramid at Giza, right where he said they were. And I talk about that and show the location of the halls of Amenti in my book, Compendium of the Emerald Tablets. You can even access the halls of Amenti on the mapping system on your cell phone device. 
you know, take you right to Giza, right where the Halls of Menti is located. They have a little pinpoint after that. Um, who was he? He was the master of all arts and sciences, perfect in all crafts, ruler of the three worlds, scribe of the gods, and keeper of the book of life. Remember we talked about earlier that everything that you think goes into space time? Every thought, even right now as you're thinking, creates an electromagnetic wave that leaves your brain skull, your case, your, your encased brain, travels out into space time forever. That information is then recorded and stored because in the universe <clears throat> stores information like a hard drive. The universe does, as above, so below. So every thought, since you were a conscious being and every thought of every other conscious entity and being is stored <clears throat> in space time. And remember I said that Thoth claims to have, uh, be the keeper of the book of life. He has access to the Akashic records. <clears throat> the, mo the modern day Bible calls it, you know, the book of life. Uh, they got it from the Emerald Tablets. That terminology came from the Emerald Tablets and made it into the modern-day Bible. This book of life, these Akashic records are real. They exist. <clears throat> if they exist because why? Information cannot be destroyed. Information is energy. Conscious light waves can't be destroyed. They can only be transformed. All energy is saved. Even, in, even going into a black hole, scientists used to think that if you went into a black hole, as soon as you cross the event horizon, you would be pulled apart and you'd be destroyed. Then they found out that, oops, we made a mistake. Not true. If you fall into a black hole, the newest calculations say that the information about you is going to be stored in the event horizon, on the rim of the event horizon, because the data cannot be lost. Uh, so if somebody came along and was able to extrapolate that data, they could put you right back together again. All information from everything exists in space-time, period. <clears throat> Thoth, also known as Hermes Trismegistus, three times the greatest. The first intelligencer was regarded by the ancient Egyptians as the embodiment of the universal mind. While in all probability, there actually existed a great sage and educator by the name of Hermes, it's impossible to extricate, uh, uh, I'm sorry, extricate the historical man from the mass legendary accounts, which attempt to basically Manly P. Hall did a great book that you got to read called The Teaching of All Ages by Manly P. Hall. Phenomenal, phenomenal book. You have to check it out. He goes in deep on Thoth and the Atlanteans and um, uh, the, the power that this being had, his intelligence that he had, how he taught people all around the planet, how he interacted with people, not only on Earth, but on other planets as well. He actually traveled to other planets to watch civilizations rise and fall and even lend a helping hand. Incredible story, incredible information, incredible person. And the person who started the very first Egyptian mystery schools, well, they weren't called Egyptian mystery schools back then, they were just called the mystery schools. Uh, they were for adept initiates only handpicked people that, uh, that himself and others, uh, I guess in his, um, uh, you know, I hate to call him his priest, but you know, his, maybe his sages that thought that this particular person or people were worthy enough of gaining this high level knowledge. Okay. That was the beginning of the mystery schools <clears throat> after the great flood about 36,000 years ago. <clears throat> Hermes states that his knowledge of the three parts is the reason why he received the name Trismegistus, thrice great, ao, 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 which means the greatest. As the story is told, the Emerald Tablet was found by Alexander the Great at Hebron in the tomb of Hermes. So yes, he has the tomb. Guy was real. He has avatar bodies, <clears throat> and he's exchanged his bodies many times. So when one avatar body wears out, he just transfers to another, to another, another body. And this is why he's got many names all around the planet. He's known as Thoth, Dehudi, Tehudi, Jehudi uh, in Africa. He's known as, in the, in the uh, South Americas, in Mesoamerica, he was known as Kukulkan, Viracocha, uh, Lord Pakal, um, Quetzalcoatl. You know, he's got all these other names. He was uh, one of the origin, te original Teotihuacans. He left <clears throat> from Africa with Africans and kickstarted the whole civilization out there in Teotihuacan. Creation according to Thoth. This is important to understand the creation um, myth, if you want to call it that. I call it the creation reality <clears throat> because it really gives us a concept or an idea of where this star tetrahedron concept came from, this Merkaba um, concept came from. <clears throat> it comes from the original source, which is Thoth and actual creation of biological organisms, uh, even planets. Okay, <clears throat> So you look in here, um, creation according to Thoth. In the creation myth, we are introduced to astrology and the influence of the planets upon man and from which man is expected to rise above. We have dualism. 
a God of the heavens and one who created earth. We see the idea of man as the son or part of God. We have man being given the power of creation. You create your own reality. The idea that man has dual nature, one in heaven and one non-material, which is the solar spirit, and one physical in the world of the matter, of the body, and then you have the fall, leaving heaven to be with nature. So these are the fall. <clears throat> human beings, I say it all the time, human beings are the fall. We are the fallen angels. Uh, our spirit has descended from higher dimensions to inhabit avatar bodies in a, in a lower density. In case and point being that we are literally fallen angels, fallen angles of light. What is your consciousness? It's light, light waves. Light waves that did what? Fall from a higher dimension to a lower dimension to inhabit a deep, a, a lower density in the third dimension, which is where we are now, this soup that we're living in right now, to experience life in the third dimension. <clears throat> so you see, this, this is what the fallen angels is all about. It's not what's been told in these religious books. It's something totally different, okay? Creation according to Hermes. In the beginning was Noah's, which is also known as God in ancient texts. Noah's created a second Noah's who became both craftsman and creates the world. Noah's too creates seven powers in seven spheres, around what will become the earth. The spheres have control over what will be the earth. They control what we know as destiny. The seven spheres are the moon, sun, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Here's the beginning of astrology. Noah's two sets the spheres in motion and life begins on earth. <clears throat> what we're talking about here in ancient times is they're describing something that we now call in biology, mitosis. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at that. We have the seed of life, six circles around in the seventh. Here's a cross section of human DNA. Look familiar? <laughs> yeah. This is inside of you. This is what you're made of. You are made up of Merkaba technology, this avatar body that you're operating. And also this flower of life pattern, it emanates and perme permeates the entire universe and all biological entities. You can see here in the mitosis, the migration from a single sphere to multiple spheres and how they organize themselves into this pattern, this pattern here, the flower of life pattern eventually, which houses a 64 grid tetrahedron which we're gonna talk about. What is the light language? An explanation of light language by Yvonne Perry. Light language symbols on drum light is information that contains the codes of creation. Remember what we talked about in the first half of this workshop, that lights create a photon, photonic light and radiation, which is also a form of light, create physical matter, create physical reality. <clears throat> Geometry is the foundational structure for art, science, music, and architecture. Its images, codes, and shapes are found in DNA, crystals, atoms, mandalas, hieroglyphs, and pyramids. The language of light is a sacred geometry produced by vibration. Light language is a powerful sacred gift, that purposeful expression of love from the creator, okay? So this is what we're talking about, tapping into this Merkaba light frequency energy and utilizing it to help manifest, utilizing it to guide us, utilizing it to get into deeper meditations, and also even utilizing it to understand how to exercise the power that's already inside of us. And it operates off of these specific um, frequencies called cymatics. <clears throat> Hollywood has hit the test rack in plain sight for decades. It's been called the Cosmic Cube, the Hyper Cube, as it appeared in uh, Avengers Infinity War, Captain America, The First Avenger, A Wrinkle in Time, Iron Man 2, X-Men, The Matrix, Thor, <clears throat> The Avengers Interstellar, Thor, The Dark World Prelude, Transformers. They even call one of the characters in Transformers Megatron, even though it's really Metatron's cube, and many more. The Tesseract um, more recently debuted in A Wrinkle of Time, also known as uh, the Cosmic Cube, it is an en enchanted object of unparalleled power. Metatron was originally born human and elevated to Archangel by God for his services as a scribe. Foremost communicator between humans and the divine, he is best known for his cube. To understand the meaning of sacred geometry symbols, Metatron's cube is based on a deceptively simple pattern called the fruit of life, which is 13 connected circles, which is concealed in the ancient flower of life inscribed on the walls of the Osirian temple of at Abydos. The flower of life, uh, which is a specific regular repeating pattern of circles rotating around a central point, contains a vast Akashic system of information. Vast Akashic system 
of information. This, that flower of life grid you just saw is what's responsible for storing all of the light waves that come out of your mind, including templates for the five platonic solids, key sacred shapes, which are the building blocks of creation, and, um, and so on. The sacred geometric, uh, uh, geometric shapes form life. Life begins as an ovum or a sphere, becomes a tetrahedron, then a star tetrahedron, a cube, another sphere, and then finally it becomes a torus. Metatron, the Metatron cube, also known as the um, Ark of the Covenant to me. In my opinion, Metatron's cube is, is, is the Ark of the Covenant. It was, it was inside the box that fit inside the box inside the Grand Gallery at the Great Pyramid at Giza. And that's my own personal theory. These are all the same thing. So we're walking around with a Merkaba around us right now. And we're not even, we don't even know it. There's a Taurus energy field coming out of us, which we saw earlier. The Sri Yantra represents the same field. The Merkaba is also a part of the Vitruvian man uh, system you see here. And then your aura that you're walking around with automatically, we already have this energy source, but we're not tapping into it, okay? We're not really tapping into it. <clears throat> now this source opens up stargates uh, to other dimensions and even to other areas in regular space time. Nikola Tesla hadn't knew this and he figured it out. And um, he knew that the connection between the Merkaba, the connection between uh, understanding the fabric of space time itself had to do with these sp uh, specific numbers, three, six, and nine. And it takes us into vortex based mathematics a little bit. These math synchronicities create sacred geometrical structures that not only um, allow a Merkaba to exist, but even allow stargates and portals to be accessed by it. This is what you're looking at, okay? So let's move on to the next, toroidal energy flow, which is the toroidal energy as above, so below. The universe has a toroid surrounding it. That is where you meet to the exterior edges of the universe, it's this toroidal energy flow that moves up, out, and in uh, uh, with this uh, flow of galaxies and the movement of planets and everything else in through this system. The same thing happens down to uh, on the um, avatar body level. You have this same exact flow happening coming out of your heart and then encompassing about 12 feet away from your body. Some people can project up to even 20 feet away, creating this toroidal energy field. We see this field on everything. This is what you really look like. That is, if you could see the energy field that surrounds your body, the shape of this innate energy field forms a torus. And it is a preferred shape that the universe uses to create matter from energy. The universe uses to create matter from energy. Take a look at the picture uh, and observe the similarities of structure in the tree, orange, tomato, dividing cells, the Earth's magnetic, magnetic belts, and the shape of the galaxies themselves. You see here, the Merkaba and this star tetrahedron is prevalent throughout the entire universe. This energy field, this source energy, this star tetrahedron that creates this flow, this toroidal flow exists everywhere and virtually in almost everything. We talked about this earlier, the toroidal structure of the human energy field being mapped out. This is uh, by the uh, Institute of Heart Math. Your field uh, is, your, uh, you know, is what you're going to get into. Really, your star tetrahedron operates within that field, and it can even interact with others as well, as we talked about earlier in the, uh, in the workshop. <clears throat> so let's look here. History has talked about the Merkaba mostly as a vehicle that allows a person to ascend or descend into the higher or lower worlds. But actually, the Merkaba is much more than just a vehicle of ascension. It can be really anything, okay? <laughs> it can be anything. Since it is a primal pattern that created all things in all universes, both visible and invisible, in the Bible, there is a reference to Ezekiel and the wheels by which Ezekiel ascended into heaven. In the Torah, there's a reference to the Merkava, which is spelled in Hebrew, that's why it's spelled in Hebrew, which has two different meanings. One meaning it's a chariot, and the other one is a vehicle. The other is the throne of God. So when the two definitions are combined, the true meaning comes to life. In ancient Egypt, the primal pattern was called the Merkava, uh, and basically it was actually the three worlds, not one. 
Mer meant kind of a light that rotated within itself. Ka meant spirit, and in this case, referring to the human spirit. And Ba meant the human body. Though it uh, could mean the concept of reality that the spirit holds, and so the entire world in ancient Egypt referred to the rotating light that would take the spirit body from one world to another. Ironically, the atomic structure of gold is the uh, ge geometric shape of the star tetrahedron, a.k.a. the Merkaba. Okay? Let's take a look at that. This is gold right here, okay? You're looking at the atomic structure of gold, AU, on the periodic table of elements. You see its structure? <laughs> Pretty interesting that the Anunnaki came here to mine gold, mine this planet for gold. They were literally mining Merkabas, is what they were mining. Interesting. The Star of David. Uh, a lot of people who uh, believe in the Jewish faith, they walk around with the Star of David and they believe it's because they're God's chosen people. When you go deeper into the history of the Star of David, you discover it's really about a star tetrahedron, the Merkaba, coming out of Africa. And it has nothing to do with God being a God's chosen person or a star in the sky, to be actually honest with you. The Star of David in Hebrew, Magen David, which is Shield of David, again also spelled Mogan, Jewish symbol composed of two overlaid equilateral triangles that form a six-pointed star. It appears on synagogues, Jewish tombstones, and the flag of the State of Israel. The symbol, which historically was not limited to use by Jews, originated in antiquity. Originally not used by Jews. Originated in antiquity. When side by side with the five-pointed star, it served as a magical sign for a decoration. In the Middle Ages, the Star of David appeared with greater frequency among Jews, but did not assume any special religious significance. It's found as well on some medieval cathedrals. The term Magen David, which is Jewish liturgy, which uh, signifies God as a protector or the shield of David, gained currency among medieval Jewish mystics who attached magical powers to King David's shield, just as earlier non-Jewish magical traditions had referred to the five-pointed star as the seal of Solomon. Kabbalists popularized the use of the symbol as a protection against evil spirits. The Jewish community of Prague was the first to use the Star of David as its official symbol. And from the 17th century, one six-pointed star became the official seal of many Jewish communities and the general sign of Judaism. Though it has no biblical or Tal uh, Talmudic authority, the star was almost universally adopted by Jews in the 19th century as a striking uh, and simple emblem of Judaism in imitation of the cross of Christianity. The yellow badge which Jews uh, were forced to wear in Nazi uh, you know, Germany occupied Europe and invested the Star of David uh, with a symbolism indicating martyrdom and heroism. So you see this evolved over time. It started off as a Merkaba star tetrahedron, a vehicle of ascension, uh, an energy field that allowed you to transform or or travel from one dimension or one place consciously to another. And then much later it turned into religion and it turned into from an energy field to uh, you know, an energy shield and a protector and so forth and so on. Uh, but it's much, much more than that. Much, much more than that. So yeah, it's a, <laughs> a, a lot of people wearing this don't really know what they're wearing or even how to access or use it. Uh, this as above, so below slide, it shows the electron orbiting a nucleus of an atom. And literally, it mimics, obviously, a solar system orbiting, uh, planets orbiting a sun in a solar system, as above, so below. This actually was a misplaced slide, but a good thing to touch on. We saw gold on the periodic table of elements, the AU already. It has a form of shape of a Merkaba. Uh, we're looking here at the Jed Pillar Ankh, okay, as we're moving into talking about Stargate technology and how this all interacts and in getting into the Merkaba. We look at the Ankh and, you know, we say, oh, wow, this is a cool symbol, meaning of life and energy, life force and birth and creation. Yes, it has all of that as well. In more modern times, just as the Star of David evolved into uh, an unknown symbol that has been misprioritized. Same thing happened with the Ankh. It's now jewelry. It's, you know, it's uh, earrings. It's necklaces and everything else. And, yeah, it's cool. I mean, but the true meaning has been hidden for eons. 
It has several meanings, actually. So here's the Ankh, the comedic womb of mankind, representing the uterus. Uh, so you see the uterus, the womb of life, the sunset and the sunrise, uh, the fallopian tubes, the vaginal canals, which is a portal of life, okay? This is uh, one representation of the Ankh that it has, one purpose that it actually has and one meaning that it has. Here's evidence of technology in the ancient past. You see uh, a jet pillar holding up uh, what looks like to be a light bulb. This is wireless electricity that existed. You see the Ankh and a jet pillar inside the Ankh in the middle, where you have a J magnet. You have large induction coils. You have copper windings on the shaft. You have a bar magnet. And um, you, know, you have the steel tube, which increases the intensity of the current. And this is technology. If you look here to the lower left, you'll see jet pillars, and you'll see a uh, jet pillar and an ankh and a staff here from um, ancient Egypt. And on the right, you see again in Pakistan, you see it you know, in other places around the world as well, this Nikola Tesla only rediscovered these Tesla coils and he rediscovered them and, and reinvented them or I guess recreated them from ancient information that he probably was privy to or had, or, or had access to, okay? This is the Nikola Tesla electrical oscillator and this is the Egyptian Ankh with the jet pillar inside. And the reason why this is important is because in order to walk through stargates and portals, the elite of the elite the gods of old, the ancient Atlanteans, the Anunnaki, each of them had their own jet pillar ankh that was um, set to oscillate at a frequency of a harmonic resonance of their own DNA. And so that was the key code to walk through the portal. If this didn't resonate at your specific uh, DNA, uh, resonate with the ankh, the jet pillar ankh, when you walk into the portal, it would destroy you. You would die. You wouldn't even be able to get to from to the end point to your destination. Okay. <clears throat> Nikola Tesla rediscovered the power of the jet pillar onk. These oscillators are expressly intended to operate on direct and alternating lighting circuits and to generate damped and undamped oscillations or current of any frequency, volume and tension within the widest limits. They are compact, self-contained, and require no care for long periods of time and will be found very convenient and useful for various purposes, such as wireless telegraphy and telephony, conversion of electrical energy, formation of chemical compounds through fusion and combination, th synthesis of gases, manufacture of ozone, lighting, welding, municipal, hospital, and domestic sanitation and sterilization, and numerous other applications in scientific laboratories and industrial situations and in institutions. While these transformers have never been described before, the general principles underlying them were fully set forth in Nikola Tesla's published articles and patents, more particularly those of September 22nd, 1896. And it is thought that there, uh, that in independent uh, photographs and, and few, uh, no, sorry. And it is thought therefore that the appended photographs of a few types together with a short explanation will convey all information that they may be desired. The essential part of such an oscillator are condenser, a self-induction coil for charging the same to a high potential, a circuit controller, and a transformer which is energized by the oscillatory. This charges of the condenser, um, and there are at least three, by the way, but usually four, five, or six circuits in tune with the regulation and its effect in several ways, most frequently merely by means of adjusting the screw under favorable conditions, an efficiency high, uh, as high as 85% is attainable, and that is to say that the percentage of the energy supplied can be recovered in the secondary transformer. Uh, that would be probably the, uh, the gate would communicate with the frequency and allow you through. While the chief virtue of this kind of apparatus is obviously due to the wonderful powers of the condenser, special qualities result from concatenation, concatenation of circuits under observance of accurate harmonic relations and the minimization of frictional and other losses, which has been one of the principal objects of its design. So Nikola Tesla really tapped into this ancient Egyptian technology and read, uh, discovered uh, the power of the, the Nikola Tesla coil, which can be inserted or worked with an onk to create uh, an energy field that can resonate with the human frequency and allow you to walk through portals. The jet symbol is also sometimes viewed as a pillar supporting the sky. 
The Jed symbol is also used as a ceremony called raising the Jed. The ceremony is meant to represent Osiris triumph over Set. During the ceremony, the Pharaoh uses a rope to raise a pillar, which with the assistance of the priests. The Jed also has been used as an amulet placed near the spines of mummified bodies and the image painted over their coffin. Numerous hieroglyphic inscriptions and architectural structures integrate the Jed, therefore hinting at its great importance and sacredness for the ancient Egyptians. But could we be missing the main picture completely? What if the Jed was actually some kind of practical device for generating and transmitting electricity uh, or a, an acoustic device or instrument? Yes, the ancients were very fond of sound and the present day knowledge allows us to see the past in a different light. When you go to Egypt, you see these jeds on, on the hieroglyphs all over the country. You see inside of crypts and tombs, you see the jed. And you see that nearby there's wireless light bulbs, which is probably why you don't see any soot in the ceiling of any of these tombs because they didn't use torches. They use wireless electricity. Here's an ankh and here's a jed. You have four levels on the jed pillar. On the right, you see what we have here from ancient Egypt. What is this doing in ancient Egypt? Okay. What are these things doing there? Now look below, modern day. What do we have? We have the same exact thing, guys. We have only rediscovered what the ancients already had been using. We've only rediscovered it. You see here in the lower right corner, you see this on every corner in your neighborhood, same exact thing from tens of thousands of years ago. We're just now trying to get back to where we were. The evidence is all around us, literally. That's not supposed to be here. So we have to understand the power of the human body. It works with the Jed to allow us to ascend into higher dimensions. The Hebrew language itself is structured in a way that is numeric and it can, it's also building blocks. So Yahweh or Yahweh, depending on how you want to pronounce it, also translated into Jehovah or Jehovah for the average English mind. Not only does the Yahweh in Hebrew, when stacked vertically, create the basic layout of a human, head, shoulders, and two arms, torso, and hips, and two legs, the, numer the numerical value of Yahweh adds up to create our 46 human chromosomes. It's read from left to right and pronounced Yod, which is fire, He, water, Vav, air, and He, earth. The four main elements of our planet. The fifth is disputed in the platonic solids as ether, or aether, universe, and in Asian and Eastern philosophy as metal, Allah, meaning arm, leg, leg, arm, and head. You have to wake up to your God self. This is how we were structured and built for, uh, based off of cymatic frequencies and understanding these frequencies and how to speak them the proper way uh, will energize you and energize your Merkaba as well. The human avatar body are pretty much built of a lattice of 12 uh, carbon-12 isotope, which is built from six protons, six electrons, and six neutrons. The isotope of carbon accounts for 99% of all forms of carbon. It is the isotope of which carbon-12 consists of six electrons, six protons, and six neutrons, six, six, six. After oxygen, the most abundant element in the human body is carbon-12. On cremation, the body returns to its carbon-12 state after all gases like oxygen, helium, hydrogen are released. Carbon-12 is one of the five elements that make up human DNA. Carbon-12 is the most crucial isotope needed to create a living biology. And this is exactly what the, winter, the writer of Revelation was referring to when he said that 666 was the number of a man. That's carbon-12. The ancients knew about atoms and quantum physics, and carbon-12 is the basis of the physical body, as we link that, and it's also the link that ties man to the physical universe. So don't be afraid of the 666. The carbon-12 isotopes, the lattice of carbon inside the body, uh, the jed pillar onk, the understanding that the torus energy field exists around our body are all components needed to create this Merkaba uh, light vehicle to get it to, to access it and actually make it move. Uh, so the DNA is composed of four elements of hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, and when put together, you get the form YHWG in carbon, which has made, uh, made us a physical and earthly being. When carbon is replaced with nitrogen, we have all the colorless, odorless, and invisible gases. They form 
the letters YH. So you're talking about the name of God, the name of the creator, whatever the name of the universal consciousness is actually encoded into the DNA of a human being, okay, of a homo sapien. Pretty interesting stuff, guys. You see here uh, this model. This is a planetary model that we've discovered that permeates virtually uh, the entire universe when you look at these points where the star tetrahedron touches the inside of any of these moons or planets. You see upwellings of energy coming from the inside, okay? Now, this same energy pattern surrounds the human avatar body as well. This is your Merkaba that you already have. Physics and scientists are just now rediscovering what the ancients already knew. The same power, the same energy is already inside of us. Hey everybody, it's Billy Carson, also known as Forbidden Knowledge. I wanna to talk to you about a very special event coming up July 30th, 2023, the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We're gonna honor people who have been contributing to the conscious community for decades. People that you know and love that have helped you get to higher levels of thought and consciousness and awareness. It's gonna be a live in-person event, but seats are gonna sell out very fast. You wanna make sure you're there in person and guess what? You can help vote for the winners. Voting is available on ForbiddenKnowledge.com and the categories are gonna be social media influencer, podcast slash radio host, TV host, actor, director, producer, entrepreneurs, health and wellness, philanthropists, authors, field researchers, archeologists, space anomaly hunters, and of course, a lifetime achievement award. I'll be your keynote speaker that night at the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We have celebrity guests performing. We'll have a halftime show where we're actually gonna perform music for you. And don't forget about the pre-event mixer where if you buy a box seat, you'll be in the VIP section and you also have private access to a VIP mixture with celebrity guests, shake hands, break bread, network, and then walk the red carpet with us and take amazing photos. It's gonna be a night to remember. You don't wanna forget this. Make sure you hurry up and get your tickets because they're selling out very fast. I wanna see you there. Forbidden Conscious Awards 2023.